everyone and a very warm welcome to Interreg Europe's thematic networking event dedicated to connected citizens and governance. This is the fourth session in our series of online networking events going through each of the topics covered by our program and today is a very special one because we are tackling three topics at once. You are most welcome to be here. I'm glad to see the people joining. Uh, very quick question once we get started. As I said, this is our fourth and final session for the year. Have you been in some of our previous sessions already? Did you maybe participate in a session on smart or social or green? Please raise your hand. I would just like to see how many people might have already been in the sessions as I start taking you through the housekeeping. How many of you kind of know the rules of the game already and how many of you might be joining for the first time? In any case, you're all most welcome to be here. Let's have a quick look at, um, at the agenda and see what the session holds. I see a lot of hands go up. So. Uh, some people have indeed been in the sessions before and know how it's working. My name is Mia Itan and I'm a communication officer at Interreg Europe Joint Secretariat and me and our team are going to take you through today's session to help you prepare new projects for our second call for project proposals. The call itself will open on the 15th of March in 2023. So right now we are pooling inspiration and ideas and seeing what you can do to uh, deliver a Europe that is closer to citizens, more connected and uh, the, has better governance. Um, how are we going to do it? The session is going to run in two parts. We will have some speakers this morning and then later on we will give the floor to you to discuss your ideas. During the first hour from 10 to 11, this session will be recorded and you will meet uh, speakers from DG Regio, the European Commission and our Joint Secretariat. And we will talk about the policy objectives, what they mean, what the European Commission is expecting to see from projects such as Interreg Europe, projects, and then we'll talk about how we do it in Interreg Europe. What are the requirements and what kind of partnerships we are planning to help you build and what kind of project activities you should plan for the for the years to come. So this is going to be the first hour, as I said, recorded and available later. And the second hour is going to happen here live only no recording available so if you want to network hear about project ideas meet people from different parts of europe uh, build new connections talk about a new cooperation opportunities uh, from 11 to 12 is your time we're going to divide you into smaller groups and, and give you a chance to really discuss ideas and exchange information uh, quite a few hands were up so thank you for that you can you can put your hands down uh, a quick note on how you can participate during this session I see the chat is already active. I would like to see where you are joining from. So uh, give us a quick message. Let us know where you're coming from, maybe what you expect from today's session. Uh, use the chat throughout the session. That is your area to share your comments, thoughts, ideas, um, and, and other issues. But for questions, please go to slido.com because we have a team working behind the scenes answering your questions in Slido. So questions, put them in Slido in writing. We will discuss some of them after each of the presentations, but we will also reply to them directly in Slido. So you will get a written, written answer there. So keep an eye on both the chat and Slido. We have some other tools as well, but we'll talk about them a little bit more later today. Um, before I introduce our speakers, I just want to do a quick a virtual roundtable through a poll. I want to know who is here today and what you expect from the session. Let's launch the poll and uh, give me some inputs on 
whether you know us already. If you've been in the previous sessions, I suppose you do by now a little bit. But if not, um, let us know if you've been in projects, participated in the policy learning platform activities, or if this is perhaps your first time of discovering the world of interregional cooperation. Um, let us know also what brings you here today. Are you looking for in information or are you more interested in either sharing a project idea or discovering what ideas are available and what kind of partnerships uh, might be building up for you to join? Um, as I said, we're going to discuss three different topics today. Uh, more connected Europe, Europe closer to citizens and uh, policy governance. and. Uh, because this is a triple session, three in one, uh, let us know also which of these topics is of your interest. Uh, you can tick all if they're all relevant. Um, good. I see that you're giving your replies. I'll give you a bit more time to, to tick that those answers because there are quite a few. And uh, in terms of your interests, we are going to start with more connected Europe, and you will you will very soon meet Jeroen Van Ol from DG Regio, who will talk about what this policy objective actually means and, uh, and what kind of activities and what kind of challenges uh, it entails, what kind of things we are trying to solve through it. I would like to know what in connected interest to you? What kind of challenges are you dealing with and what kind of solutions would you like to find? Same thing, after Jeroen, we will continue with Laura Hageman Aralano to talk about Europe closer to citizens. And if there is a particular interest that you have in that area, let us know through the chat as well. And uh, that'll help us shape the discussions a bit today. Um, good. I think we can close the poll and have a quick look at the results. It uh, seems very consistent with what we've seen in the other networking events. We have quite a few Interreg Europe project partners here. Um, if you are from a project, please let us know which project you've participated in. Put the acronym in the chat, maybe say a few words about your activities. And we have some who know a little bit about us, but not that much. And about half of you are here for the first time. So there will be a lot of information, but we are also here to help you. So feel free to ask questions and uh, clarifications if and when needed. We're trying to make this uh, as accessible and understandable for everyone as possible. Most of you are here for info. Great. So I think we will get going with it. Also, in terms of the topic interests, a very equal split. 60% interested in more connected Europe, 67% uh, interested in Europe closer to citizens and 54% interested in better governance and policies. Um, Excellent. I think you will all find interesting information in today's presentations. And without further ado, let's dive in and start talking about um, policy objective three, more connected Europe and sustainable cross-border mobility. Jeroen, I give the floor to you. Thank you, Mia. Um, yes, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeroen van Oel. I work in the uh, so-called smart and sustainable unit in DG Regio. Um, and more in particular, I uh, deal with the uh, transport and mobility issues. I have dealt with uh, several countries, uh, several programming uh, periods as well, notably Bulgaria, Romania and, uh, and Latvia. Um, so yes, for the programming period 2021-2027, uh, we have two policy objectives or parts of policy objectives that deal with uh, with uh, transport um, and uh, and mobility. Uh, policy objective three uh, is, is 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 the main transport policy objective, but there is also a a uh, special objective in policy objective two that deals with uh, multimodal uh, and sustainable urban uh, urban transport. Um, yes, so to 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 paint a draw uh, to paint to paint a broad picture of 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 uh, what the uh, where the emphasis lies in 2021-27, the current programming period. Uh, well, I mean, we we, we continue. Uh, our our aim is to continue improving the European transport uh, system in in all its uh, facets, uh, be it road or rail, um, seaborne transport. Uh, the only uh, form of transport that has lost uh, much of its uh, 
uh, priority in, in in cohesion policy is uh, is air transport for uh, for obvious reasons uh, from a sustain sustainability point of view. Um, but yeah, the 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 trans European network uh, uh, and other transport networks are of course still not uh, not completed. There are still many obstacles in and and uh, in connectivity and differences in the uh, quality of the network. Um, of course, you have heard of the EU Green Agenda and, and generally uh, of, of, of uh, climate change. So we need to accelerate the shift to sustainable and, and, and smart mobility, make, make network uh, transport network uh, connections more, uh, more efficient. Um, and yes, there is there is an urgency, and that is of course the uh, the added value of uh, of European funds, of cohesion policy funds, is that they uh, can be deployed in those areas where you need uh, extra investment to uh, to make a change and to uh, to accelerate the uh, the uh, the shift to a a more sustainable uh, world, a more sustainable transport uh, transport network. Um, next slide, please. So, yes, this means that we need to uh, raise the quality and the resilience of, of the network. Uh, in, 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 in the case of Interreg, uh, you, of course, can think of, of missing links and bottlenecks with cross-border uh, uh, cross connections. Uh, we need to focus on on areas where people can uh, change or transfer from from less sustainable modes of transport like roads and cars to uh, to more sustainable to public transport. Uh, all these uh, facilities, of course, have to be uh, accessible to for everybody, including the uh, the handicapped or the people who are challenged in their in their in their mobility. Um, Transport has to become a lot smarter. The, we need to be deploy more more uh, digitalization or, or deploy more more uh, ICT uh, and and other technology, uh, artificial intelligence as well. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the one of the main areas where we need to change is to make the uh, the transformation to to sustainable to sustainable transport. Um, meaning real uh, more pro public transport, but also more active uh, active transport, active mobility, uh, walking, cycling, uh, etc. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yes, uh, the what what can be the role of Interreg uh, in this uh, in this equation? Uh, of course, um, yeah, there is less budget available EU wide. Um, and the share within cohesion policy is it has always been uh, rather small. Uh, also, because uh, well, you have the the mainstream programs where there is the uh, the grant of the uh, of the investments in 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 transport in in hard transport infrastructure. Um, but what we try to do with every programming period is to have a strong thematic and territorial focus. Uh, why? Because we need to show uh, we need to show impact. Uh, there is little point in spreading uh, spreading investments over a wide wide area of of, of smaller projects. I'm talking about the mainstream project uh, because then you have very little impact. Of course, Interact has a better opportunity to finance. Uh, and uh, finance smaller projects and show that even or also smaller projects in 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 size in in, in funding can have a a big impact on the cross border uh, cooperation and 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 contacts. Um, yes, so that that brings me to the the point of that that uh, Intrek is is in this case complementary to the to the other funds uh, mainly regional development fund and and cohesion fund but also the connecting europe facility the recovery and resilience facility and 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 the loans of the european investment bank um, these interreg actually 
if you if you look at the mainstream programs, they will always every every action, every investment action, priority action will mention the uh, the complementarity to to interreg uh, and the fact that interreg should actually be embedded in the mainstream programs. Uh, one reason being that there is more budget uh, more budget uh, available. We call this. Uh, yeah, embedding the the interreg into the into the mainstream programs. That's why interreg. Well, you should not count on 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 making large large sum investments into hard infrastructure uh, as part of interreg programs. Also, because they, they they often form part of the bigger transport networks. But if you think that might be necessary, it is worth taking a look at the at the mainstream programs and see what the possibilities are uh, what what possibilities are there in those programs to 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 complement uh, an interact uh, interact program next slide please so what are the opportunities what could be the opportunities uh yeah well making an inventory of of those of those missing links or transport connections that you would like to have uh, improved between on both sides uh, on both sides of the border uh i think most of the uh, people working in 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 that area will probably already have a good idea of what those missing links and uh, missing links are um once that inventory has been made you can start to 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 draft a a, a transport strategy and how to deal how to to, to uh, face those challenges uh, head on uh, feasibility studies and advisory support uh, can be financed uh, uh, give giving the opportunity for 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 experimenting with innovative solutions um as I pointed out in some cases you can the financing of transport infrastructure, the hard infrastructure and equipment can be can be an option, but um, yeah, as as the budgets are smaller, uh, as I said, uh, it it might be worth uh, checking mainstream programs to see how they can complement interreg programs if that would be an investment that is uh, that is uh, required. Uh, next slide, please. Um, well, uh, yes, so I, I was talking about special objective 2.8 multimodal sustainable urban mobility and 3.2 within the as as the framework for the uh, for the transport uh, uh, for any transport investments in the broadest sense, but uh, there's also an option and and Laura might 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 uh, explain a little bit more on this point uh, within policy objective five Europe closer to citizens to uh, to have uh, at least transport related elements in in in, in projects that might be eligible under that uh, that policy objective uh, next slide please yes yeah, so, but uh, interact as such has a Certainly, potential for uh, for for to to increase the uh, the efficiency of uh, of sustainable of sustainable mobility and what the the advantages of, of interreg is that it can take into account uh, yeah the 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 specific context of the areas where these investments have to take place so that they can. Uh, uh help with with finding tailor-made uh, tailor-made solutions for for the different obstacles and and spatial and institutional contexts uh well it will be no surprise that of uh, that when i say that uh, interreg is a provides an opportunity for closer cooperation um because uh, when it comes to transport in cross-border areas, uh, you're often faced with political and administrative obstacles um, that if they are studied and if there is a strategy, if there are contacts between the, the different authorities on both sides of the border, that it will give an opportunity to, uh, to improve cross-border regional and, and local mobility. 
actually, uh, there has been a recent study in cross-border public transport uh, where they identified 57 obstacles, uh, and the majority of which were due to administrative issues. Uh, I might give the uh, the internet uh, address or the internet link to that to that study in case you want to uh, have a closer look. Um, this, this, let's see. Um, yeah, of course, I mean, the technical assistance can help uh, or at least make an inventory of technical barriers, uh, such as lacking interoperability or, or, or missing sections. But um, as I mentioned earlier, this is often, yeah, not uh, often not 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 easy for for local and regional authorities to solve since uh, as, as, as these cross border networks might also be part of the of the national or even even uh, trans European. Uh, networks. Um, let's see. Um, yes, I will mention that study later at the end of the uh, of the presentation. I think we're getting close. Um, yes, please. Next slide. And that's it. <laughs> so, um, well, I'll uh, I'll be available for uh, for any questions that you. Uh, that you might have, uh, Mia. I don't know if you now want to switch to uh, to Laura. And um, yes, thank you, Jaron. I think you had some very good points there about uh, the transport challenges overall, but also about addressing these obstacles and and seeing how we can indeed build better systems together through exchange. Uh, keep that in mind. If there are any questions, you can put those in Slido. We will come back to your questions, but we will now continue to our second speaker from DG Regio, uh, Laura Hageman Aralano, who will talk more about Policy Objective 5, Europe Closer to Citizens. So so let's let's talk a little bit about what citizen uh, covers, and then we'll, we'll see if there are any questions afterwards. Uh, Laura, at this point, over to you. Hello. Uh, good morning, everyone. I heard that uh, we're a high number of people, 200 to 250, and that's uh, that's very good. Um, I'm Laura Hageman. I work in the unit of Integrated Territorial and Urban Development, and I'm in charge of presenting PO5. You will see that this is a different PO uh, because, well, it's not thematic, so um, it's a PO that is first devoted to proximity to citizens, that is delivered with an integrated approach and through territorial tools. So let's see what all means. First of all, next slide, uh, let's look at the strategic context behind the PO. And uh, first of all, uh, PO5 is a PO that allows to work with the level that is closer to the people, uh, with the emphasis on multi-level governance. This enables to connect or tends to connect local development needs and potentials with European and global objectives, is the idea. It also comes from the recognition that regional and local authorities have a key role and responsibility in meeting these EU objectives, such as the European Green Deal, um, or to tackling the consequences of uh, the crisis, COVID-19, we've been how uh, they are at the forefront, so the, the, the local level, or now uh, the, the Ukraine crisis. And on the global front, it's very important to translate the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development into local actions. And here we see a wide uh, commitment from regions and municipalities in localizing the sustainable development goals and achieving them. Uh, next slide. PO5 is also the policy objective of integrated territorial approaches, which have been endorsed in two strategic documents, one for urban areas, the LASIK Charter, and another one for other territories, the Territorial Agenda 2030. They've been, they, they have both been signed at the end of 2020, and they set up the vision for territorial and urban development. They've been endorsed by all the member states, and they highlight, all of the both of them, the principles for place-based integrated approach and, uh, and the multi-level uh, governance. Uh, next slide, please. What are the type of challenges and potentials that have a strong territorial dimension and that need then, uh, in our view, an integrated approach? Well, first of all, population trends and challenges, such as the challenges of lagging regions, growing cities, rural areas that are close to cities, but also remote rural areas uh, with all the um, population reduction, and economic decline uh, that we see in them. On the other hand, 
the, spa, the spatial dimension of poverty, such as the need for regeneration of deprived neighborhoods, uh, involving the local community in communities and mitigating the negative impacts of gentrification, the need to promote a balanced and polycentric development, so not to have all the population uh, concentrated in mega cities and the rest of the map uh, uh, empty. For that, you need to, to, to promote this polycentric development, uh, the need to limit urban sprawl or promoting uh, urban models such as the 15 minute city, where I will find everything I need and all the services around 15 minutes of where I live. Uh, also, uh, to target the potentials and challenges of different territories, such as promoting innovation and economic, pot economic potential in urban areas, while promoting connectedness in rural areas and peripheries, and building on the endogenous resources uh, by, for example, promoting sustainable tourism. Next slide, please. How does uh, PO5 enable these integrated and place-based approaches to tackle the challenges and potentials that we, that we have seen? Well, first of all, uh, it offers complete thematic flexibility to support all types of territories um, with all types of actions that can belong from PO1 to PO4 and without enabling conditions. This on one hand, but on the other hand, it sets a series of requirements uh, because PO5 has a specific method that operationalizes the principles set out in the territorial agenda and in the Leipzig Charter of place-based integrated approach and multi-level governance. And we often refer to these as minimum requirements. And thirdly, it should be implemented through territorial tools. So let's see this method and the territorial tools now in detail. The method in the next slide is based on the development of integrated territorial strategies. So every intervention needs to be set up as, as the base of, a, of, a, of within an integrated territorial strategy. These strategies are cross-sectorial, thanks to the thematic flexibility that offers the policy objective. They are, um, the basis is at an area, so they need to set up the territorial focus of the strategy, and they are based in an analysis of the challenges and potentials of that particular territory that normally is sub-regional. Uh, the strategy should be designed and implemented by the relevant territorial bodies, they could be, they will be urban when we are talking about urban areas and other, so supra or uh, urban, but also regional uh, uh, territorial bodies. And these relevant bodies and local authorities um, must be involved in the selection of the operations that are going to contribute to the objectives of the strategy. So these are all the requirements to promote this uh, also multi-level governance. Uh, in the next slide, we see, okay, that uh, here to say that there are two specific objectives, one for urban areas and other for other territories that are not specifically urban areas. And in this programming period, there's an earmarking, there was before, but it has been increased from five to 8% of the national ERDF envelope to be devoted to uh, urban uh, development. On the other hand, the border between the two typologies is not uh, set in stone, it's, it's not defined, uh, because when developing urban areas, for example, we should to, to pay special attention to supporting functional urban areas uh, due to their importance in triggering the cooperation between local authorities and partners across administrative borders, and also strengthening rural linkages. But typically under 5.1, we see strategies tackling the effects of agglomeration, tackling urban challenges such as pollution, urban sprawl, poor housing, deprived neighborhoods. While under 5.2, we see strategies tapping on the endogenous potential of territories, natural, cultural, touristic, and also aiming to reverse or deal with the demographic decline and the unequal access to services. So finally, let's look at the so-called territorial instruments. They are necessary to implement PO5, and they are designed to enable an integrated response at the local level. All the rules uh, and all the proposed instruments are applicable to all kinds of territories, and they have been harmonized in this programming period. So we can choose, for example, to implement our strategies within PO5, with the thematic flexibility allowed by it, 
uh, using a locally developed territorial tool that complies with the minimum requirements in terms of integrated approach, participatory governance. And in this case, we are using what we call other territorial tool, which you can see in the right-hand side of the screen. We can also choose to use PO5 in combination with other POs or bundling funding from other programs or other funds, such as the social funds uh, or the agricultural fund or the fisheries fund, or even not using PO5 and just using all the other POs, in which case we will constitute an integrated territorial investment. So that is indicated when you want to, to bundle funding from, from different sources. And finally, if we want to enhance the participatory approach, for example, we will lean towards CLLD or community-led local development in the middle, where many functions are delegated to the local communities and, it, and, and it's meant to, um, to, um, and, uh, to foster these participatory approaches. Finally, I will say some words about the implementation of all this on the ground. Uh, first, by indicating that if you are implementing 5.1 through sustainable in, uh, urban strategies, next slide, you will receive the support of the European Urban Initiative. The goal is to give a coherent support to, to all types of cities of all sizes. First, supporting innovative actions in cities with their direct funding and offering capacity building activities, policy learning opportunities, and exchange of good practices among all the cities interested or currently implementing or drafting strategies, and also by linking them to contents and knowledge uh, and outcomes from URBAC, the urban agenda of the EU, and the urban innovative actions themselves. The European Urban Initiative has been launched this autumn uh, with the launch of the first call of urban innovative actions, but the capacity building strand will be inaugurated at the Cities Forum on the 16th and 17th of March, 2023, to which you are warmly invited, all of you. In the meantime, next slide, there's a very useful and resourceful corpus of learning and examples of practices in two handbooks focusing in each of the specific objectives. So one in urban strategies and another one focusing on other territories, 5.1, 5.2. Both handbooks have been, uh, have been developed by the Joint Research Center and uh, they identify challenges, available resources, good examples, and issue recommendations. And I really invite you to uh, visit them. They are available online and uh, they can tell you much more than I can in 10 minutes about uh, integrated approaches and, uh, and how to, to implement them. Finally, I'm going to finish mentioning two examples of an integrated strategy and a project that fits in the logic of PO5. The first strategy in the next slide is uh, the strategy of the town of Fundao in Portugal. Fundao is a small town of 9,000 inhabitants. So size doesn't matter. Uh, it has been trying for, for years to fight the population and peripherality. And finally, it has used digital transition as an opportunity for social and territorial cohesion. And they have achieved to create an innovation ecosystem that is nowadays a reference in Portugal. You can see some of the figures of what it has achieved uh, down in the slide, but I have to say that it has been a long-term journey and it has not been achieved overnight. And it's a strategy that encompasses um, uh, everything from gaining economic attractiveness uh, to uh, how to uh, do sustainable mobility in rural areas. So it's a very uh, uh, integrated strategy. And uh, secondly, the strategy of Den Haag, very different, a very big city that targets a broad range of objectives in relation to, to innovation, low carbon economy, uh, attractiveness uh, um, and the business ecosystem, job opportunities. And it's focusing on different, um, different neighborhoods. One of them is Sveneningen. And this neighbor, um, it's bordering the beach and it's a touristic destination, but at the same time, the local population experiences uh, social and economic marginalization. So they, for example, they have used CLLD, community-led local development as a tool to face and, and to tackle the latent social tension with the population and to include them in the decision-making processes, going as far as inhabitants being able uh, to um, initiate projects themselves. So a very 
good example that is part of, uh, of the handbooks that I mentioned before. And uh, this is my last slide. This is all from my side. Uh, thanks for your attention and I'm ready to take any questions. All right. Thank you very much, Laura, for this overview. And as you see, indeed, a slightly different approach from what we've seen with the other policy objectives, more an integrated one and a little bit more open in terms of what can be covered. Um, I would like to ask Jeroen to be back uh, on, on screen, and I would also like to invite one more representative from the European Commission, DG Riccio, our desk officer, Estelle Roger, who is also here with us today. Uh, as we said in the beginning, this is a bit of a special session because we are covering three topics at once. And uh, while we won't go very deep into the, the full, full, full details of each of the topics, there are indeed some questions uh, from our participants. And I would like to start with one uh, to you, Laura. Uh, what exactly is meant with embedded in the OPs, in operational programs? What, uh, how does this embeddedness work? Mm -hmm. I, th I think that was I think that was a transport related question. I think so. <laughs> I see. All right. Yes. Okay. Um, yes, get on, please. <laughs> well, in 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 short, it means that that uh, the mainstream programs, uh, which are, by the way, we're not allowed to say operational programs anymore. Uh, the mainstream programs uh, are supposed to take uh, cross border issues uh, into account when when. Uh, designing their strategy. So that means that, uh, uh, I mean, of course, depending on the priorities that they have made in those programs, that there are interreg issues that, that uh, are meant to be addressed. Um, so that's what I meant with, uh, with, with, with embedding, that they are basically part of mainstream programs as as well perhaps not formally since there is a separation between interreg and mainstream programs but many regions with mainstream programs of course also a border uh, have have international borders with uh, with 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 other member states so yeah to 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 simplify it a little bit interreg is also part of uh, it can also be part of mainstream programs and they are required to to uh, to to pay attention to that uh, to that aspect of their of their programming i hope i answered the question Yes, thank you for this clarification. There was another question about the report, Jeroen, that you mentioned, but we already received the link. It's in the chat. It's in the Slido, so you can find the link there, as well as links to all of the reports that Laura mentioned in her presentation, or the additional resources have been linked to the chat, so you can have a look at those. Uh, one more question, and then I would like to get some final tips from each of you. This goes jointly, Laura, to you and Estelle, because uh, we see now that there is indeed some potential overlap with the topics, especially when it comes to the more open ones, like like citizens and better governance, um, would you have a comment maybe on on how to how to differentiate between between one or the other topic and where to where to focus? Maybe if we start with citizens, Laura, maybe some key features and Estel, if you have anything to add on this, you could complement. Um, well, I, I don't I don't uh, really know all the subtopics and and what can be. Um, you know, implemented in each of them. Uh, so I guess I uh, would like to say that in terms of PO5, there is it's this a lot about governance. So so the how to do the things, not about what you do. So it's a, a lot about um, exploring on uh, integrated approaches, so cooperation between different levels, both uh, vertically and horizontally participatory approaches, involvement of the stake stakeholders, and how to work on, uh, on the basis of a strategy uh, that is developed by, by, by the relevant partners themselves. So this is where maybe uh, in inter Europe, there's a good opportunity to cooperate in this type of uh, solutions uh, um, because cooperation is essential and learning from each other is essential. So. Maybe maybe here you have a, a good um, uh, yeah a, a, a good way to cooperate. Yes, indeed, indeed. Um, Estelle, anything you want to add, especially maybe about about the interreg specific ob objective of better governance? No, no. I think uh, Laura was clear on this. Me, I wanted to say. That. <laughs> 
other things to to um, uh, to the participants because I would like really um, to to encourage them to to apply under Interreg Europe because. Um, I mean, interregional cooperation works. Uh, we have Interreg Europe since 20 years. We have the results, the long lasting benefits and effect for the regions, for the different stakeholders on, on all this project. Um, so if you apply and, uh, and you are successful, you will have a very interesting journey and a very rich experience for four years because uh, uh, these projects are lasting for four years. So it's a very nice um, and interesting um, experience for you. And you have to keep in mind as well that um, all the, the results and the knowledge coming from this uh, all this project an uh, interregional cooperation project they also feed and influence uh, the policy making and uh, being at uh, local regional uh, national and even european because we we benefit from yourself we benefit from the experience on on the ground so we really need uh, this, this this program i just would like to um to to highlight one point that is really important when you apply and um, enter Europe, uh, because it's essential. Uh, it's about cooperation, and because it's interreg and uh, cooperation, it's about a very good quality of partnership. So you really have to ensure that you have the right partners for for your project. Because uh, if you want to do some policy changes to improve your, I don't know, your, your strategy, your program, or whatever you would like to improve as policy, um, I would say intervention, then you need as well the, I would say the responsible persons um, for these instruments in order to, to have the, the best uh, results. So you need to ensure good quality of partnership among the partners so that the, the project can have achieve a very good uh, good result. Um, so just would like to encourage you to, to go for it. And I do hope that um, yeah, this last networking session on PO3 and PO5 gave you a lot of uh, inspiration for your project. So good luck. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Estelle. Very nice words of encouragement. And, and I agree with everything. And we will indeed talk more about the importance of building the right kind of partnership. Uh, before we close and move on to uh, our next speaker, Jeruna Laura, any final, final tips or words of encouragement perhaps from you, considering that we have some people who already have experience, what can they do, what should they do? And those who might be new to cooperation, any, any messages you want to pass to them as we, as we start talking about cooperation ideas and projects? Uh, Jeroen, maybe from you first. No, not 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 really. I think I I, I tried to pack my messages into uh, into the presentation. Um, yeah, as I said, uh, well, the main the main advice is is uh, keep an eye on uh, on the mainstream programs uh, when it comes to if you have. Uh, if there are budget issues, uh, it's it's not just um, invest actual investments in transport infrastructure, but it could could also be technical assistance or or, or other uh, uh, to 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 see as 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 a as a source of financing in case it uh, it's it would not be possible under under an interreg uh, program. Excellent. And, so considering uh, yeah. considering the links, yes, yeah. and that's very good. Uh, I, I hope there will be many initiatives and uh, uh, to 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 improve the uh, the cross border connections also. And yeah, I mean, in a way that starts with transport because you have to get from one side of the border to the other. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, that is what 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 keeps the uh, the EU going. Uh, this this big project that we're all uh, that we're all part of. Um, so yes, I wish you all the best and all a uh, lots of inspiration and and good luck. Thank you. Thank thank you thank you Jeroen. Uh, Laura, your final comments, please. Well, only uh, one final comment. So not to be not to be afraid. Uh, this is uh, working by doing. Uh, so go there and uh, deepen on on this governance. I know it's not a new concept for Interreg. Uh, there's a lot about governance in interact projects, but uh, work on that. And, uh, and, 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 and we always see very good projects uh, in interact. So we will be looking at you to see what you bring in this uh, new programming period. 
and uh, connect with the mainstream also uh, we'll try to cooperate uh, much more uh, much more closer and also uh, let's try to learn from from each other also what we do in mainstream and what you do in uh, in interact so just keep in touch that's my <laughs> my last comment keep in touch excellent tips thank you all very much for contributing to to our session and setting the stage uh, I want to thank you at this point. If there are any additional questions from our participants, please put them in Slido. We'll pass them on to the speakers. Uh, thank you all. Now we will move on to talk about how exactly this works in the context of Interreg Europe. And we will do that with my colleague Ilaria Ramaglioni, one of our policy officers, who will take you through Interreg Europe in a nutshell and the key requirements for our project partnerships. Ilaria, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to be here uh, today to have the opportunity to present uh, the program. So uh, today I will introduce you the main feature of the program. Estelle already gave a nice introduction, uh, touching uh, really the essence of the program. And I will also give you an update on the first call results and um, on what is coming next. And uh, I would like also finally to go back a bit on the topics of this uh, networking event to give you also some reflections from the program side. So uh, we saw from the poll that uh, most half, uh, almost half of the people of the audience of today uh, hear about the program for the first time. So it's a nice opportunity to introduce you and give you an insight on the program. Um, Interreg Europe is part of the European Territorial Cooperation. So as you can see, and as you may know, there are many Interreg programs, more than 100, and Interreg Europe is part of Strand C, Interregional Cooperation, together with uh, Urbact, Interact, and ESPON. Um, what is the objective of the program? So the scope of the program uh, is uh, to help uh, um, local, regional, national authorities, organizations, to deliver and uh, to develop and deliver better policies. So we do uh, this uh, in the, the 27 European Union members, countries, plus uh, Norway and Switzerland. So we have 29 countries involved. We cover um, all the cohesion policy priorities. We have the six topics. Today we are tackling specifically connected cities and governance, and we have a budget of almost 400 million of RDF. So let's focus now on the scope of the program. As I was mentioning, the objective is to help uh, policymakers uh, um, in delivering better policies, improving regional development policies. The approach is very broad because we mean, uh, we refer to any means of public intervention, uh, so any uh, local, uh, regional, national strategy plan law that is developed by uh, public authorities in the territory to solve a specific challenge, a specific situation. So you can see that it's quite broad. Of course, the program still keep the focus on structural funds programs. So we are still there to help for a better implementation of investment for growth and jobs programs. So how we do this, um, how we achieve our objective? So we do this by supporting the exchange of experience uh, processes, so by supporting networking, exchange of knowledge, identification, innovative approaches, and all this learning process implies the um, identification, analysis, and hopefully the transfer of knowledge uh, between uh, the different uh, um, policy authorities in Europe. So the identification and analysis of good practices. So uh, considering the rationale of the program, um, we are targeting mainly policymakers, as I was uh, mentioning. And we are uh, different from um, cross borders or transnational cooperation programs as we are a capacity building program. So as I was mentioned, we focus on the exchange of experience. We support, uh, we help uh, policymakers to network and share solution for a identified challenge and um, issue. 
Uh, and also we, as I uh, was mentioning at the beginning, we are uh, the only pan-European program covering the entire territory uh, of uh, the European Union. Next slide, please. So um, let's focus now concretely what are the actions of the program. So we do this by supporting interregional cooperation projects, and I will come back to this uh, just after. And um, through the policy learning platform, the policy learning platform has a strategic objective of exploiting, capitalize all the knowledge, all the results, all the solution and innovative ideas coming from our projects and make them available to a wider audience, to any um, regions in Europe by, for instance, uh, uh, preparing policy papers, uh, policy brief, uh, thematic publication, but also organizing uh, networking events, uh, thematic uh, workshop, uh, webinars, where uh, policymakers can meet uh, and exchange. So the objective is uh, also to open up uh, more opportunities, uh, opportunities of cooperation also for those uh, regions that are not involved directly in our uh, projects, um, for instance, through uh, peer reviews or matchmaking uh, activities. So let's uh, now focus on the projects main feature. Um, we require our project to form a partnership from different uh, um, areas of the uh, European Union. Um, they identify a common interest. They work together for uh, four years, as was mentioned uh, in the introduction. So in the first three years, which is uh, the core phase, they are focused on the exchange of experience and on the integration of all the lessons learned from these activities, such as uh, study visit, thematic workshop, peer review, staff exchanges, and to integrate and feed all these lessons learned into the policy instrument address in the project. And in the last year of the project of the activities, which is the follow up phase, they mainly focus on monitoring the effects of these policy improvements. So the duration is fixed and the focus is on exchange of experience. So as mentioned before, we are a capacity building program. So we support this type of activities. Um, an important information to share today is uh, uh, who is eligible, who can participate in our project. Uh, of course, public authorities at uh, local, regional, national level, but also uh, public law bodies, so bodies governed by public law. Uh, in this case, you can consider um, uh, what we call intermediary organization, regional agency, business support organization, also university, depending on the legal status, and also private no-profit bodies. In this case, depending on the country, uh, we may mention, for instance, a chamber of commerce in this type of organization. But regardless of the legal status that I just mentioned, uh, what is really important to keep in mind is the involvement of uh, the policy responsible authorities of the policy instrument that you are going to uh, address in your project. This is a must because we um, considering our uh, rational, our objective of improving regional development policy, you need to involve those organizations that are uh, responsible officially uh, of uh, delivering, of uh, elaborating, preparing policies, uh, those kind of policy instruments. So they must be involved in the project. And this is also subject to an eligibility criterion. So for at least half of the policy instrument address, those organizations, those authorities must be involved as partner, while for the remaining policy instrument, uh, they will need to be involved as an associated policy authority. So this is just to give you uh, an insight into the main elements of our projects. Um, moving to the geographical coverage, as I was mentioned, we are a pan-European program. We want to 
put uh, into practice the cohesion policy uh, principle. And for this, uh, with this in mind, we require our project to uh, cover, to ensure a broad coverage um, and cover the four areas that are defined in the slide. You can see the four geographical areas, but also to include uh, in the partnership a mix of more or less advanced region as defined in the regulation. So this is also an important element which is subject to um, uh, the eligibility. Uh, looking at the co-financing rate, which is also important, you can see that the program is not uh, um, financing 100%, but we have a good co-financing rate because we are making use of what of the maximum of what the regulation allows. So for public or public equivalent bodies, they will get 80% from RDF, while private no-profit will get 70% from RDF. So this is the, the two co-financing rate. And then of course we have a dedicated um, co-financing rate from the Norwegian funding and for, uh, from the Swiss funding. And then let's move uh, now on the first call results. You may uh, know that we have launched a first call um, that was closed in May 22. We was a rather short, but still we receive many proposal, uh, 134 proposal. Uh, you can see from the slide that the uh, those projects were uh, covering mainly the topics of smart, uh, green and social. However, there is, uh, let's say, around 10% of projects that were decided to work on the three topics uh, that we are tackling today. So still, uh, it's, um, it's a nice uh, um, result because these are uh, new topics also for the program. And we cover all the partner states, so this is also very nice. And we um, are about also to launch a new uh, call, a second call that will be open uh, 15 of March 23. All the topics will uh, be covered, we will uh, are open. Uh, the call will close at the 9th of June, so it will be a bit longer. You will have uh, more, a bit more time to prepare your project uh, proposal. And uh, the application pack will be available in the program uh, website uh, early 23. So please check our website to get all the key documents and all the information about uh, the second call. Um, since we, uh, we are uh, now finalizing uh, the assessment of the first call, I would like to uh, share already uh, some lessons learned so we can help you uh, for the preparation of your uh, proposal for the second call. So first of all, as I was mentioned before, um, please ensure that your partnership goes beyond transnational cooperation areas. So, uh, as I was mentioning, it's important that the partnership cover the four uh, geographical areas and you go beyond uh, um, cross-border transnational uh, programs. Please keep in mind, for instance, that uh, Slovenia and Bulgaria are now eligible for the MED program, just to uh, remember this element, and also some parts of France. Um, regarding the uh, partnership, uh, um, another important element, please be very careful uh, with the selection of your partner and when uh, they are indicated as a policy responsible authority for the policy instrument addressing the application form, please make sure that they are actually the organization with an official mandate of uh, delivering and elaborating, implementing those policies, because again, this is subject for an eligibility criterion. Um, a very important element is also the selection of the policy instrument address. So try to be specific as much as possible to choose the policy instrument that is relevant for the topic that you want to um, discuss and tackle within your partner. So um, 
that this uh, challenge, the issue that you uh, want to um, address is shared among the partners. So it's consistently addressed uh, throughout the application form and, and is clearly and well reflected in the policy instrument uh, uh, selected. And just to conclude uh, um, also, um, ensure that at least one of the policy instrument address is an investment for growth and job goal program because this is also a requirement and uh, eligibility criterion. Uh, and now coming back to the topics uh, of today, the three topics uh, we had um, very nice and comprehensive uh, introduction from the Commission. I would like just to share some reflections and to repeat again, what are the topics that our project can tackle under these uh, three thematic areas? So when we talk uh, about a more connected Europe, it's all about sustainable and smart mobility, how to make it more resilient, uh, more uh, secure, accessible, intelligent, and can be tackle both at local, regional, national level, but also at uh, trans-European level. When we um, then uh, mentioned citizens, there was the question from uh, Lorenzo uh, before. Uh, here, uh, um, you should select a citizen if uh, you want to exchange of, uh, experiences, solutions, on uh, the way of um, elaborating, implementing, delivering integrated territorial development strategies specifically. So it's not about supporting citizen uh, initiatives directly, but it's really to exchange on those type of policies, which are integrated territorial development strategies. Um, and then for governance, just to also clarify a bit this overlapping on the distinction between these policy objectives, um, governance is a is about to process related matters. So it's not uh, um, about thematic issues, but you, uh, if you select this uh, uh, policy objectives because you want to work. Uh, an exchange on the way a specific policy is elaborated so or is implemented. It's about the process. So uh, for instance, we give you some example on the way you evaluate and monitoring uh, your public intervention, your specific policy, or the way you manage public procurement or uh, state aid, for instance. So see, this is just to give you an idea that is about processes. Uh, so it's a no thematic uh, uh, objective, let's say. So uh, an important element that we really, uh, we are very careful with is the innovative character. This is very important across all the policy objectives, all the topics, uh, because we require our uh, projects to um, explain and justify, demonstrate in the application form, what is their um, added value uh, compared to what uh, already has been uh, supported, has been uh, financed and tackled through uh, past or current initiatives. In, uh, so you need to uh, consider that we have already approved 258 project within the 2014-2020 programming period. So we want to ensure that uh, uh, there is an added value. Uh, how the new proposal brings an added value compared to those initiatives and goes beyond uh, what has been already tackled. Uh, of course, in your case, uh, might be if you select one of these three topics, it might be easier to, uh, let's say, justify the innovative character considering the novelty of these topics. Indeed, none of these three topics have been covered directly uh, in the previous programming period within Interreg Europe. However, we have identified two examples of uh, running projects from 2014-2020 that are 
closely uh, related to uh, citizen topic. This is just an example on the way uh, they were exchanging experiences on integrated territorial development strategies. These are land, sea, and uh, wave. And you can uh, see, uh, you can uh, go into their website and have an idea. And this may uh, clarify also what we mean uh, with uh, this uh, topic. Um, this is just, uh, yes, an overview about the program and then about the call. So I thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Ilaria, for this overview. We did indeed get some questions, but I'm once again happy to inform you that our Slido team has been doing an excellent job and has answered to all of those questions in writing. So if you asked a question, you will find the answer in Slido. If you didn't ask a question, go and check Slido in any case, because you will find more information about who is eligible, what type of partnerships, um, uh, what kind of policy instruments, these types of questions have been answered. So more information in Slido, go over there and check that out. Um, I see also that a lot of ideas are being shared in the chat and I think people are eager to really start building their partnerships. So before we go into that, Ilaria, just a follow-up question to you. What can we do to support them? What kind of assistance is available? Yes, um, there are many tools that the program has prepared to support you, to help you in uh, uh, preparing the, your uh, project uh, proposal, your application. So first of all, uh, there is a dedicated page in the program website, Look for Funding, where you can find all this information, all the tools available. So for instance, you can check the relevance of your idea, of your proposal by um, using the self-assessment tool, which is a very short questionnaire of around eight or 10 questions that you can go through and assess if you are uh, in the good direction, if you are meeting the program requirements. And we really recommend you to use this very quick uh, assessment tool. Then you can also get inspiration from uh, our approved project, as I was uh, mentioning before. So you can uh, see uh, their pro um, project website and get some ideas Ideas, but also you can see uh, some of the project ideas that have been shared by our community, by our user in the program website. And you can also share your project idea because uh, you can publish it and uh, describe what, uh, what do you intend to do with your proposal if you are looking for partners. And this is, can help you to find also the right partners. And you can ask a feedback uh, from the JS, from the program on your project, uh, on your proposal, your project idea by using an online form. Um, and uh, you can, of course, uh, find all the key documents in our uh, program website. So uh, first of all, the program manual, which is really very important. It's, as we said, always our Bible. Uh, but there are also the, uh, the application pack uh, for the call. So for the second call documents, you will see early 23, there will be uh, the term of reference and the application form and declaration template. So these are very important. Uh, then you can also have a look at the FAQ section with uh, these frequently asked questions. And you can also contact us through the online form, through our website, or uh, you can, uh, um, check your doubts or you need some clarification, you can contact the point of contact of the um, concern country. And these are also very important for checking the uh, role and the status of the policy responsible authorities. And just uh, yeah, some tips before closing this uh, presentation, this part, uh, as I mentioned, uh, read, please, uh, please read the program manual very carefully. It's really very important throughout the, all the preparation of your proposal. Uh, make use of all the tools that the program prepare for you. Um, and do not also hesitate to contact us to ask for feedback on your project idea. And as a um, last point, which is also very important, please make sure that you are aware of the selection process so that we have an eligibility step and those 
proposal that will not be uh, eligible, will not be considered eligible, they will not go further to uh, the next steps of the assessment. So make sure that you are aware of all the criteria and you can make, uh, meet the program uh, expectations. So thanks a lot from my side. Thank you, Ilaria. And again, if there are any additional questions, our Slido team is still working behind the scenes, so you can pass those on to Slido and they will give you a reply there. Ilaria gave you some very good tips on, on how, to, how to prepare your application. She showed you some tools that are available. Please do make use of those. You heard earlier today that it's very important to find the right partners, think about the challenge you plan to solve, and think about what is the best possible group to put together to solve it. So keep these in mind as we start networking because that is going to start in just a couple of minutes. Right now, I want to thank all of our speakers from DG Regio. Thank you, Ilaria. And uh, I have a very quick poll for you because as we move to the second part of today, um, we had quite a big audience today. These are the kind of new topics for our program, but I would just like to know how many of you are still going to stay and discuss with us? Uh, how many of you are going to stay and share project ideas or join discussions? And how many of you are planning to use the tools that we described. Um, uh, have a look at our website, test the self-assessment or, or make use of the search or on our community to find partners, or maybe to use the networking tables that we have as a part of this event to a group around specific project ideas. So just a quick input there, uh, just to see what to expect for the next uh, hour, hour or so. Uh, thank you. I see that the replies are coming in and uh, some of you are still thinking about what to do next. Uh, no worries. We will take you through the ideas that will be presented and then we will open breakout groups and let you discuss. You can still think about if you want to join a group or not. You can stay and listen to those uh, short pitches and make up your mind. Some of you, I see, will have to leave, but that is fine. This part has been recorded. You will have access to all of the material presentations and everything we've shared up until now. Once we get to the discussions, this will not be shared. It will not be recorded. It happens live only, but we have a tool called networking tables where you can find information about the project ideas and reach out to people who will present them if you cannot stay with us for the, for the next hour. I just want to remind you that uh, we've had four sessions. This is the fourth one and we've covered all the different topics and you will have access to all of the recordings and materials. So, so check out also the other sessions and the other project ideas uh, in addition to today's session if you are interested in smarter or more social or greener Europe in addition to the topics being discussed today. Furthermore, you heard the word policy learning platform a couple of times today. If you would like to know more about opportunities to work together with other regions beyond projects and, uh, and see what other opportunities there are, please join our policy learning platform colleagues on the 5th of December to discuss why networks are so crucial for, for the next generation of policymakers and how you can benefit from policy learning platform and its services to reach out to other regions. I also want to remind you at this point before uh, moving to the networking that indeed the call will launch on the 15th of March and this will happen during our interregional cooperation forum Europe Let's Cooperate in Stockholm, Sweden and the call will be then open for 12 weeks until the 9th of June. All right, um, I will explain the networking, but I would also like to open a closing poll for the first half, uh, just to get some input from you on how it has been working so far. We're going to leave this running. It will be an anonymous poll, so just give us some feedback. Let us know how it's been. Did you get the information you were looking for and uh, was it useful for you? Let us know and I will explain the networking. All right, so here's how it's going to work. We will have two types of rooms, uh, idea specific ones for a project pitches that we will explain or introduce very shortly and also open networking areas. So if you still want to discuss a citizen topic or governance or more connected Europe in general, you can go to these open rooms. Uh, or you can join one of the project idea discussions instead. These rooms will be completely led and guided and moderated by you. So this is your moment to share, discuss and get inspired. Uh, we will be here to help you if there are any technical issues, but the discussions will happen amongst the participants. So we hope you make good use of this opportunity. Let's have a look at um, other tools that we ha have available. I mentioned a networking table. This is a tool that we have as a part of this event. You will find 
find all the ideas that we will discuss today in that table and you will find information about the host and information about people interested in this idea. If you haven't yet checked it out, go and do it at the latest after this event and uh, mark your interest on those topics that interest you so that you can keep in touch also after the event. So this is your tool for follow up and for staying in touch with each other. It's linked to our community and it helps you to reach, reach out to each other and keep discussing. Get ready for the call. Use our online assistance tools to prepare your project application. The first part of developing any project is coming up with an idea. And for that, you need inspiration. Explore the projects we've already approved to get ideas. Make sure your next project is innovative and builds on past achievements. Next, share your project idea on our website. Let people know what you're working on and see if they want to team up. Need more partners? No problem. Browse our online community for people with similar interest as you. Get in touch with them by email. You never know, you could find your perfect match. Once you've got your project idea and your partners, check that you're going in the right direction. Use our short eight question self-assessment tool to make sure your project is relevant to our program. So what are you waiting for? Try out our online assistance tools and get ready for the call.